All right, hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, hope you heard me on the audio check. We gave it a few minutes to make sure our audience was here. So if you hear some background noise, it might be some people shuffling in a couple minutes late. Uh, but thanks for calling in on time and thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Drew Youngs and I'll be moderating today's uh, first of three wastewater training uh, all new EPIC internal staff webinar series. Uh, kind of a long title, but be a lot of good information today. Um, our speaker is Jim Le Liberty, and I'll tell you a bit more about Jim before we get started. Uh, but before we get into the meat of the training, I just wanted to give you, uh, for those of you that are calling in, um, some tips on using the system if it's your first time. It can be a little confusing. Um, your line is muted, so we can't hear you, uh, but the idea is that you can hear us as we move through the slides and chat about them. Uh, to communicate with me or to pose a question for the group or to Jim, you can use the, the chat function. Um, as Jim is presenting today, I'll be keeping an eye on the questions that come in via chat. And when we have you know, a good opportunity for discussion, when I have some questions coming in, you know, I'll ask Jim when it's a good time. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll chat about your, your questions. So use that chat function uh, to communicate with me. Um, you can toggle in and out of full screen by using the uh, arrow function. You just uh, you want to hover at the top of your screen where that uh, green bar should be, and it'll give you kind of a drop-down menu to uh, navigate the system. Uh, we are going to record the webinar, so uh, this will be up probably on our website in the future. Um, we'll have it in electronic form so you'll be able to access it. Uh, you can contact me, contact Jim, contact Tom Groves, and you'll be able to get that uh, information. So a little bit uh, about Jim. Uh, Jim works with us to develop and coordinate uh, New EPIC's wastewater and safety training programs. He's the co-chair of the Massachusetts Training Advisory Committee and oversees Massachusetts Wastewater Management Training Program. Uh, before coming to New EPIC, he spent uh, over three decades as a chemical process engineer in a variety of uh, different industries. Um, so for the training overview that Jim's, or excuse me, this is an, an overview of GEMS training. Um, it's broken into three separate units. Each unit is going to be a standalone webinar of about three hours, and these are on three, the three different dates that you're probably aware of. Um, and again, they'll be available later as well for you to come back and review. So unit one is day one, that's today. Uh, Jim's going to tell us about uh, some reasons why we treat wastewater, the history of uh, regulations, wastewater sources and characteristics, collection systems, preliminary treatment, and a little bit about disinfection. Um, and then unit two is intro to wastewater microbiology, biological treatment, and unit three, which is day three in February, uh, will cover nutrient removal, biosolids, and an overview of industrial pretreatment. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Jim. Thanks, Drew. Uh, to expand a little bit on uh, what Drew was telling you about myself and outside of outing me for over three decades of work. <laughs> Actually, a uh, chemical process engineer by degree and uh, got my uh, career started with sugar, which is a long way from dealing with wastewater. But uh, nonetheless, I fell into the wastewater field pretty much by accident, the way most people do. I uh, was working for a small uh, chemical company in Nashua, New Hampshire. And they actually had a uh, wastewater treatment system because they were direct dischargers of their effluent uh, to the Merrimack River. You all know what that direct discharger is? What? Spewing the wastewater into the river. Right. We were going directly into the Merrimack River. And at the time I took over the process, uh, it had been operating for about five years. Uh, they had a NIPIS permit, and I imagine you all know what NIPIS stands for. And uh, at that time, had actually no certified operators. They were just chugging along nicely and getting away with it. Uh, in New Hampshire, the regulations were a little weird. Uh, since we weren't really dealing with domestic waste, uh, it kind of fell under the radar. We still had a state permit. We had the NIPTES permit. Uh, and we ran an activated sludge process, much like most municipal systems. And I felt that since I was going to have to learn all this stuff very fast, I might as well be certified. And I went through the certification process up in New Hampshire, uh, eventually getting a grade four, which is their highest. Currently hold a five combined down here in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts is a bit different from most other states in that they have 
industrial certification at the combined level five and six here in Massachusetts. That means I could work in an industrial facility, I could work in a municipal operation. Uh, that being said, I uh, got thrown into it very quickly. I found it to be a very fascinating field and uh, I kind of miss having a plant to play with, but nonetheless, this is a lot cleaner. <laughs> So what we're doing through this uh, program is basically a boiled down version of what I normally do over a six week period, six, uh, one day a week to six weeks. Uh, for people that are getting into the business and want to become certified, I also do a higher level one, an intermediate course of people advancing up through the grade levels. Uh, so I'm jumping over a lot of stuff that you really don't need to know, but you're going to get a good overview of what goes on to nuts in a municipal treatment plant, uh, the various types, and give you something to go on. Like when you're doing your work, relate back to how this may or may not affect what we're doing on our end of the pipe. So again, that's me. This is my uh, my email address, my direct line to my desk. If you ever have any questions about uh, wastewater treatment or anything like that. We've got a lot of people here primarily out of New York State. So you guys run a little bit differently in your certification process uh, from what we do here. Uh, so again, I'm, this, this is my deal. I get up and we go through the room and find out who's around. That's a little bit difficult in this current circumstance, but uh, you know about me and how I got started and why I'm the guy in the front of the room. So we're going to talk about wastewater treatment. Again, this morning, I'm uh, going to go over a brief overview of the whole process, how it got started and all that. Uh, this particular uh, plant that you're looking at now is Deer Island in Boston, Mass. Uh, Deer Island's uh, one of the largest facilities in the country. Uh, typical day is about 350 to 400 million gallons. Uh, the highest number I've seen go through the plant was uh, we had some very heavy spring rains about, uh, well, it's almost 10 years now. And the highest number I saw over there was 1.3 billion. The difference being a billion gallons of rainwater going through the plant, really. So why, why are we in this business? Why do we have to even deal with this stuff? Civilization went on for centuries without any wastewater plants, without any septic systems or cesspools or any of that kind of stuff. Why do we have to do this? Population growth. Population growth? Population growth? Population, well, that certainly exacerbated the situation, but uh, everybody wants clean water. You want to be able to go out and go canoeing or swimming in the lakes and the streams. And it's also a part of drinking water protection, it's part of it too. Uh, untreated, this water is thrown into the rivers and the waterways. Uh, we're going to have oxygen depletion. So basically, the river's going to die off. Aquatic life can't survive. Uh, we're going to have odors and scum and it's just going to look nasty and be ugly and you're certainly not going to be able to drink it. Uh, the issue that we're dealing with to a large degree now uh, as we move forward with technologies is uh, the problem of eutrophication. Eutrophication is when uh, you throw a lot of nutrients into the river water and you help grow aquatic plants. Algae and weeds and all that and they slowly take over. And really the biggest part of our uh, business really want to look at it from that standpoint is we're in the health business. Disease transmission, waterborne diseases. So again, this is what we're trying to avoid. Fish kills. Ammonia uh, toxicity could generate that. That little green pond. That's eutrophication. That's the problem that we deal with. And just nasty looking streams. And again, these are the problems we're trying to deal with. Eliminating waterborne diseases. The largest reason for population growth to the degree that it is now is because of wastewater treatment and the improvements that have happened over the past hundred years or so. But again, we go back a long ways. There was efforts made to deal with waste, human waste largely. Uh, again, we go back to uh, days of Roman emperors, you know, early days AD, public restrooms and all that stuff on a cold morning, but what are you going to do? <laughs> but really, Rome, uh, 50, 60 AD, Rome brought in over 2 million gallons of water each day from the mountains. The, the aqueducts, they had all the nice fountains. It was very pretty, but its real purpose was to flush the waste out, get it in the river, and make it go away. That was wastewater treatment for centuries. 
get it out of town, let it be somebody else's issue. Even then, they had concerns over control of water. You had old frontiness here. He was the guy in charge of water back in 80 AD. Nobody could do anything without checking with him. Necessary that a part of the supply flowing from the delivery tanks be utilized not only for cleaning the city, but flushing the sewers. That was treatment back then. Moving away. Yeah, as time went on, we did have that population growth. You had started to have some really dense uh, inhabited cities and stuff. And again, they would put ditches in the middle of the street. They were actually starting to, the concept of sewers to take stuff away. But again, it was still just to get it to the nearest river and have it flow away. Uh, I've got Shakespeare up here because uh, the time of Shakespeare, right around 1600, the island of Great Britain really only grew in population because of emigration from continental Europe. Left to itself, the island would grow its population, big cholera outbreak, boom, it would drop. Typhoid, boom, same thing, it just went back and forth and had no real growth. Early days of the United States, all you needed was some land, you dig a pit over in the corner, put up a nice little shed, you're good to go. Uh, and even in the populated cities, there were back alleys, they had all the privies just lined on up. Uh, and actually, uh, if you remember, Shelley, we had a, somebody came in and showed their license for night soil. Yes. Foster. Uh, night soil was, it was the industry that there were people would come in, clean these things out, and they would do it during the night. And then they'd do some <laughs> for fertilizer later on. That's where night soil actually came from. Uh, or the uh, version of septic hollers, I guess you want to look at. <laughs> Again, as time went on, populations grew, you know, big cities, uh, started soaring. Back to the 1600s, we have some sewers. Uh, even in the Boston area, they still dig up wooden pipes uh, that were found for use in transporting water, and transporting waste into the harbor, and just to get it out of town. No real treatment, just move it out of the way. Early part of the 19th century, had to have some issues, uh, had a big uh, outbreak in London that really started to open up uh, some eyes. Science was advancing at that time, microbiology and other stuff was uh, developing. Uh, we got a lot of sewers were being put in. Uh, but we had this big cholera outbreak in London in 1854. And a fellow by the name of Dr. Snow was the guy that actually made the connection. And they found this well pump that was in the city. Oh, he studied all of the cholera incidents around this particular area and found that this one well, this little blue circle here in the center of all this mess, seemed to be the problem. And when they investigated, they found that the well was actually less than three meters away from a cesspool. And it was leaking in, and anybody that lived in the area was using that for water. People were walking by. That's why you had some of these outliers. We're all getting contaminated from that. And they realized that they had to really separate these two items not let them uh, get together. Again, with sewering and some other material, you look at sewered cities as opposed to unsewered cities in terms of the cholera deaths. They change because now it's not so prevalent. You can have all these cesspools all around town contaminating drinking water. And if you look at individual cities, as they sewered over time, typhus deaths all dropped off considerably. So they started to realize that you had to keep them separate, but they still weren't really treating. It wasn't until the latter part of the 19th century that uh, in Britain they came up with this process that they called salt pellet drop. Basically, they pump all the water into a tank and let it sit. Solids would settle to the bottom of the tank. The supernatant looked relatively clean. They take that and throw that in the water. The sludge that would be removed on a regular basis was then taken off the use as fertilizer. That was all well and good. And doing a pretty decent job, except for the fact that this uh, liquid that they were sending off to the river still contained about 60% of the VOD of the wastewater, wasn't it? Because it was soluble. It didn't settle out. Around 1890, they developed what's called a trickling filter. And this is actually a real method of wastewater treatment. What we've got here is a nice little thing all built of stone and stuff. So you've got a tank, you fill it with some sort of a media, whether it's rock or broken bricks or something like that. You pump the water in, let the water trickle down through that media. Organisms live on that media. And where does it sound? 
One man's waste is another man's treasure. Well, that's food to them. All this wastewater, they would break down the BOD as it trickled through this unit. So you had a very low BOD coming out of this thing. When we talk about trickling filters, we'll talk in much more detail about this next week. Uh, it's not a filter in the traditional sense. Think of it as a BOD filter. In fact, you're going to have more solids coming out of this than actually go in. Uh, and this idea was brought across to the U.S. a little after the uh, turn of the 1900s. Now, the activated sludge system, which is the most common method used today, was a lot of that development work was done here in Massachusetts over at Lawrence Experimental Station. And this is where you really have uh, the optimum amount of control over what's going to happen in your process. Uh, you can do all sorts of things with these organisms uh, by manipulating their conditions. It's a very common method. But even at that, there was not a lot of regulation forcing anybody to do this sort of things. Uh, rivers were still just dumping grounds for waste, whether it's domestic waste, industrial waste. Uh, yeah. This is, uh, you can't quite see it, but this is the Merrimack River. Oh, there you go. Oh, thank you, Drew. Uh, this is actually up in Franklin, New Hampshire, where the uh, Winnipesaukee and the Tumajawasik come together to form the Merrimack River. And uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's an old slide, as you can tell. It's pretty well yellowed out. But still, uh, there's no fly fishermen, there's nobody tubing, there's nobody swimming. That water is barely looking like the water. Nasty, nasty stuff. And that isn't even 50 years ago. The Nashua River. Yeah, I'm from Nashua. I remember the river looking like this. The mill was making red paper that day. Oh, well, it's just gross stuff there. I actually had a job uh, in a mill much like this one you see on the right, alongside the river. It was right in downtown Nashville. <coughs> and uh, the plastics thing, we had a fellow who put together all of these dyes, powder dye to mix with the plastic for whatever it is we were producing that day. And at the end of his shift, he just washed his floor and all that stuff just went right out into the river and right through downtown Nashville. And no big deal. That's just the way things work. But as time went on, a little bit more time, uh, there was an incident out in Ohio. Uh, this is the Cahoga River, and we got our flammable sign. A bit of a joke, but uh, not really. Uh, 1969, Cleveland, Ohio. This picture on the left is a large. Uh, anybody been to Cleveland? Wealthy well, city. So you're familiar with the flats? No, I oh, don't. You've been to Parma. Into the Rock and Roll Hall. Big industrial area. When you cross the, the bridge over the, the Cahoga River, and you look out and you see this. It was the stereotypical picture of pollution of every stuff you could think of. Uh, and one day, the river caught fire. Fire lasted about 15 minutes. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't the first time the river had caught fire. It wasn't the first river to catch fire. Uh, but it just happened to happen at a time when the environmental movement was really starting to get some wheels. And they finally came across this picture. And, and that was the turning point for us. Our rivers will burn. What else do we have to wait for you know, before we finally get something? As a result of that, we ended up with our, what we call the Clean Water Act, an amendment to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1972, Public Law 92-500, which brought in billions of dollars for training engineers, training operators, building plants, upgrading plants, completely turning over the whole aspect of wastewater control. And their challenge was make them fishable and swimmable by 1983 and eliminate all pollutant discharges, which is a pretty lofty uh, desire, uh, to down to the waters by 85. And they did that very, very well. Turned it over very fast. Uh, this is the Merrimack River now. I live just a mile up the hill. And people are jet skiing and fishing and having a grand old time. Lowell's got a swimming beach on the Merrimack River. Uh, the National River is a scenic waterway now. They have fishing tournaments. It's a beautiful thing. I like to go kayaking on it. Still very nice. So again, what came out of the Clean Water Act is this National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. That's what regulates all discharges to the waterways of the U.S. Any treatment plant that is a direct discharger has a NIPIS permit, whether it's a municipal plant or an industrial plant. Again, I had one because I was a direct discharger, even though I wasn't a municipal operation. And permits and Take a look at a permit now, they just get larger and larger and larger with the stuff that's being thrown in there. Where you can discharge, what your allowable flows are, all sorts of stuff. They break them down by seasonal limits for various things. 
very important that operators understand what's going on there. Uh, they've got to monitor and report. I'm going to let it laid out there in very, very detail. Uh, this, this is, uh, being in this business is kind of strange when you talk to people. Uh, you familiar with this guy up here in the upper corner? I, I, the more I teach, the fewer people know who that is. They, they <laughs> kids. What do you know? Uh, that, that, Ed Norton up there in the upper uh, left corner. Ed Norton was on a TV show with uh, Jackie Gleason called The Honeymooners. And he is <coughs> the only sewer worker ever to be on TV. You know the show with the sewer worker, you show the difference. <laughs> Ed was a great guy. But, you know, you wanted a friend. He was right there with you all the time. But he was about a four watt bulb. <laughs> so when you tell people what you do, that's kind of what's the matter with you? <laughs> you got a job someplace? <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, a lot of uh, the operations challenge, uh, Water Environment Federation uh, has competition with wastewater operators every year. We do it regionally with NWEA. We just did it uh, in conjunction with uh, NIWEA last uh, spring. Uh, it's a competition between operators in five different categories, and it, it's really quite something. If you ever get a chance to go to WEF or even to the spring uh, meetings, something to watch these guys go to work. It's quite a bit different from here to there. A lot of technology involved in this. So when we look at uh, wastewater areas that uh, people can get involved in, uh, we have the collection systems. Collection systems are what we used to call sewers, but sewers is kind of a nasty name now, so we, we call them collection systems. Uh, operations, that's where all the fun is, if you ask me. There's maintenance. Uh, the lab, which does a, a lot of the uh, analyses for the operation, helps a lot with process control. And certainly there's the management, uh, which is why we developed our management training program to try to drive people into that position. So when we talk about wastewater, you kind of know what it is. But really, if we break it down a little further, what are we talking about? I don't have my sound there, but yeah, we know what goes down there. Yeah. Yeah. Domestic wastewater is from residences, schools, uh, commercial establishments, industry. We also have, in most communities, we have stormwater mixed in with our wastewater. As much as we'd like to separate it, we still have a lot of that getting in there. Uh, again, see, the sun seeds. Pretty much comes from everywhere. We talk about collection systems. We have a sanitary sewer, which will handle domestic wastewater from houses, from industries, and what have you. Uh, you may also have storm sewers, which are totally separate. Ideally, every town should have separated systems. Rainwater is just water. It really doesn't need to be treated. We don't need the extra volume going through a plant. Just uh, wasting some money on it. Uh, but again, we're in an old part of the country where if there's a pipe on the ground, you might as well use it. So we have a lot of cities that still have a lot of combined sewers. That means everything goes into one pipe, and that's why uh, Deer Island got that extra billion gallons of rainwater. Mm -hmm. We also have pump stations. We're not living in Flatland, Illinois. Got to get over the hill, so we've got pump stations out there to help get us over those high points. When we look at what's in there, uh, the two major components that we deal with are biochemical oxygen demand (BOD) and total suspended solids (TSS). Uh, in the initial uh, NIPTES permits, uh, these limits were set at 30/30. Those were two prime things that uh, they were out to reduce. We have some amount of inorganics; those are dealt with through a preliminary system, try to remove those as much as possible. We also have the pathogens. You know what the pathogens are? Uh, disease. Those are the disease-carrying bacteria. We don't know who they are, so we treat all of this water as though it's pathogenic and disease-carrying. So we've got to be very careful. It's one of the uh, concerns in working on these facilities. And we also have the nutrients. This is the big issue now. Uh, because we did a very good job on reducing BOD and TSS. That's a pretty simple job, really. Uh, the nutrients is a whole other issue. We talk about nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the components that cause the eutrophication. Uh, might have grown up in an area where down the road you had a nice pond that you could use all summer long. Now it's just a bog because it's filled up with weeds and everything. They die off and slowly choke the whole thing. 
So four components of wastewater that we have to consider. Uh, first of all, the hydraulic. When we talk about the hydraulic component, we're talking about the flow to the treatment plant. Chemically, we have largely organic matter we're concerned with, but we also still have to be concerned with some of the energy. Physically, temperature, color, odor, and we have solids, and solids of various types. We have floatable, settleable, suspended, and dissolved. Talk about these in a little bit more detail. And from a biological standpoint, uh, we have organisms that work under uh, various situations. Largely, we're dealing with aerobic bacteria. They like free dissolved oxygen in order to survive, much the way we do. Uh, we also have anaerobic bacteria who function very well in the total absence of oxygen. We try to avoid that as much as possible because they tend to stink the place up. But there is a time when they work to our advantage, so we may do that at some point. But largely, we're talking about what's this middle one here, facultative bacteria. They'll adjust to the situation. If you have oxygen, Terrific, they'll use it. If you don't have oxygen, they'll find another source of energy. So, and of course, we have the pathogens and the non-pathogenic. So hydraulically, we talk about the flow of the plant. Just you yourselves, probably 60, 70 gallons a day. When you encompass everything else, with going to work and everything else that happens through the course of the day, it's about 150, 160 gallons a day per person. So if you know how many people are in town, you can kind of guess the size of the system. What this particular graph is showing you is what's called the diurnal effect. It reflects the act, uh, flow to a treatment plant based on the activities of people over the course of the day. Uh, what you see here is if you start here at 12 midnight, uh, we got a flow rate of about 2.6 million gallons, and it just drops off steadily down until about 5 o'clock. Everybody's home and in bed. We've got some 24-hour operations, late night at Taco Bell and that sort of stuff, but not much is going on, so the flow drops off. Then at 5 o'clock, what happens? The alarm goes off. You've got to get up. got to get the kids ready for school. You've got to take a shower. Dunkin' Donuts is backed up into the street and everything else. Boom. Well, goes up dramatically up to midday. Peaks off a little bit. I guess the people are taking a siesta or something, but... Five o'clock at night, now you gotta do the laundry, you gotta give the kids a bath, it bumps up again, and then slowly goes up. This will vary considerably depending on the size of the facility. In a small town, you see something as dramatic as this. At Deer Island, it's basically a flat line. They get stuff 35 miles away from Framingham, so you know, it really balances out quite a bit. What we're seeing here is the difference between this, the bottom line is, you know, See that same sort of diurnal effect going over the course of the week. And the upper line indicates what happens during the rainy season. All that additional rainwater getting in, requiring you to work that much harder. But basically, you're treating the same amount of constituents, except for the fact that a lot of it's just water. And this is the problem. Two things that are causing that issue, even if you have a separated sewer system, that's what we call I and I. First I is inflow. Inflow is a result of poor condition of your collection system. Cracked pipes, broken pipes, poorly installed pipes, bad joints. Rainwater comes, percolates through the ground as you want it to. But then it sees this big 36 inch pipe that's just open space. It's a whole lot easier to go in there than to fight its way through the gravel. And it comes. And that's just extra flow going to the plant to make life harder. Really got, uh, that one. That's infiltration. Yeah, is inflow. Inflow is illegal connections, roof cutters, a very common thing throughout the Boston area. There's been a lot of work done to remove those things. Some pumps that are hooked up into your waste system should not be there. Should just be pumped back outside. Uh, and this is uh, this bottom picture with the smoke coming out of the front yard is a technique that. Uh, collection system operators will do from time to time to try to tack down illegal connections. So they'll put a little smoke bomb in the sewer and see where it comes out. It's quite humorous sometimes. Coming <laughs> <laughs> out of their house going, ah. <laughs> The other issue that uh, is an issue, a problem, particularly during a heavy rain period, is uh, what we've referred to as fats, oils, and greases, or fog. 
Grease and oil should not be dumped down into the system. Baking grease should not go down there. You know, so, well, I'll run the hog water, throw a little down there and chase it out. At some point, it's going to hit some cold pipe and just play it out. The top picture is the nice clean pipe. The bottom one is after years of being down the street with the clam shack and whoever. The thing is, as that pipe diameter clogs up with grease, its ability to take flow is greatly reduced. So when you do get the big rain, you've got a problem. Three roofs. And what is being done, oops, that's what happens when the big rain comes and it can't fit through that pipe anymore for any number of reasons. That is a violation. That's a sanitary sewer overflow. Your permit does not say you can discharge there. Uh, and really, the, when it comes to fat soils and greases, it's actually the homeowners that are the biggest problem, much more so than uh, a lot of the restaurants. So they are, uh, can be a, an issue. Restaurants have grease traps installed, not always installed properly. Uh, they're inspected generally by the health department, who doesn't necessarily understand how these things work, so that could be an issue. There we go. Not good. You may have heard the uh, term combined sewer overflow. This is a situation uh, that's installed in a collection system in order to protect the plant during extremely high flows. Uh, when you think of it, and we'll learn about these guys next week, but we're dealing with single cell bacteria. 95% of the organisms in the wastewater treatment are single cell bacteria, and if you just triple the flow through a plant, they can't swim upstream that well. And if you don't protect your plant, you're liable to lose all of your bugs to the river. It's not a good thing. So in high flow situation, combined sewer overflow, and what we see is the dry weather, your collection system is built such that your typical flows will hit some sort of a barrier and continue on to the POTW, publicly owned treatment works, the treatment plant. But an extremely high flow, it will allow a certain amount of that to go straight to the river. Unfortunately, what that generally does is it causes all sorts of grief with uh, the residents, uh, it shuts down swimming beaches from time to time, it can be uh, not just things. Uh, folks out in uh, New York State, you're from with the Gowanus Canal bit, kind of tells you what's happening there. If you ever saw that video, it'd be really nasty during a sanitary uh, combined sewer overflow. Increasing leaves are being uh, set up. Oh, this shows you Boston how many they had, and they've reduced them. They've closed 32 out of 84, at least at the time of this slide. So they've reduced quite a bit. A lot of them are being designed so that they actually have some amount of treatment. They'll remove grit solids and they'll also disinfect. So you're not you may be putting water out there, but at least you're taking care of the pathogens. And the whole uh, collection system is being uh, under put under scrutiny through a process that we refer to as CMOM, capacity management operation and maintenance. It basically says that you have to maintain your collection system, you have to inspect it on a regular basis, find those leaks, cut out the tree roots and all that stuff, deal with the uh, Grease issues, there's been increasing enforcement on that end over the past several years. Uh, physically, when we look at this water coming into the plant, it's typically a gray to a light brown. Uh, it can vary depending on what industry is putting in there. Uh, it, <laughs> when it's fresh, it has a musty odor, if you can imagine that. Uh, it should not be obnoxious. If it's got that rotten eggy smell, then it's definitely old. Uh, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. And as we dealt with. From a temperature standpoint, we get what we get. It's a lot of water, we can't heat it up, we can't cool it. Uh, this time of year, the water coming into the plant gets down close towards 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty well insulated, but still, the cold will get down there. Summertime, it's up around 70 degrees. And what that does to us is we have to operate our plants slightly differently in the wintertime from we will in the summer. Because much like us, bugs don't do as well in cold water as they wouldn't warm water, so you have to adjust for that as the seasons change. And again, from the solid standpoint, we have floatable, settleable, suspended, and dissolved. If we were to take a one liter sample of our wastewater coming into the plant to do a, a solids analysis on it, you would find that really 99.9% .9 of that inflow is in this water. All of this work is done for one tenth of 1% of what comes into the water. 
He has settleable solids. These are uh, solids that if we take a sample, set the jar on the bench, and let it sit there for about a half an hour, they're all going to drop to the bottom of the jar. The non-settleable solids, uh, that stuff is just going to hang there and make that water look murky no matter how long it sits. It's colloidal material is very small, thin density is water, it's got no reason to go up, down, sideways. Uh, and then we have the larger portion is dissolved solids. Soluble material that doesn't settle out, doesn't filter out, that's where we really rely on the organisms to do the work. You see in this picture is uh, Imhoff combs. How we test for settleable solids. Basically, a, a one hour test. You put a one liter sample into the cone, let it sit for 45 minutes. Uh, at that point, you take a stirring bar and just gently rub the wall to make sure nothing's clinging. You give it another 15 minutes, and it's a direct read. You can see what's coming into the plant. That's the bottom portion. Those are the settleable solids. After primary treatment, there should be nothing there. And remove those quite easily. You get a little bit of floatable stuff, but we have no measurement for that. Well, organically, again, dealing with human waste, animal waste, whatever you grind up in your uh, kitchen sink disposal, uh, all comes down to us and it's measured as biochemical oxygen demand. Uh, biochemical oxygen demand is an indicator of the organic strength of the wastewater. It's not a real thing. Uh, it's a, kind of a weird uh, test. It's a strange way to run an operation. Uh, another test you can do to get some ideas to the strength of the uh, organic matter in your wastewater is a chemical oxygen demand, COD. COD is the chemical digestion of organic matter. The difference being a BOD test is a five-day test. Take a test a sample today. Uh, we're going to prepare it. Put it in an incubator at 20 degrees Celsius for five days. Uh, it has to be in the dark. You don't want to generate any algae growth because algae is doing them. We read the amount of oxygen in this sample before we put it in. We read how much is out there and we do a calculation. Again, this is a permit limit on any treatment plant. Well, the weird thing is you find out five days from now that your plant's in trouble. Not a fun way to run. A COD, you can get an answer in about three to four hours. My uh, operation was completely different in that I had seven different production areas that could drop anything at any time of day. I couldn't wait five days to tell if I was in trouble or not. So we ran CODs on a regular basis. But by and large, uh, the EPA wants to stick with BODs as their, uh, their test. So we're sure. We have a lot of things to worry about, a certain amount of alkalinity coming in. You may need to adjust that time to time. We'll talk about when that's required. Uh, our inorganics, again, nitrogen and phosphorus, those are the nutrients we're going to be dealing with, sand and grit. Uh, this time of year, particularly in a combined system, we've got salt and sand thrown all over the streets, then it rains, it all comes into the plant. We've got that extra loading of that kind of stuff coming in. Our pH uh, doesn't vary too, too much. Well, we have to maintain that, make sure it's in the proper ranges for the various operations we're doing, whether we're doing uh, nitrification or pH, uh, phosphorus removal, ORP, some plants are using that as a method for control. So if you look at a total uh, analysis of our wastewater coming in, what does it mean? Suspended solids coming in, on average somewhere around 200 milligrams per liter. Milligrams per liter, parts per million, pretty much interchangeable. Let's think of it that way. Our settleable solids, a small amount. Our VOD, this varies considerably from community to community. Some are down 150, some are up at 300. Uh, it's also a part of how tight your collection system is. That's, that's a typical range, somewhere 150 to 300 is pretty normal. Uh, if you did a COD, you, find you can build up a relationship between the two so you can get some meaning out of that. Uh, nitrogen, coming in at 40. We have to get down to very low single digits. Phosphorus, not a big number, but what we're looking at now is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 100 parts per billion. Not easy to do. The sulfates, uh, the sulfates are only a problem if we go uh, towards an anaerobic situation because that's where that rock tank smells going to go. 
And this, this one right here is one of my favorite ones. This is total coliforms. We use coliform or a particular bacteria, we use them as an indication of various things, particularly when we're disinfecting, uh, if we've done a good job. So uh, they're very prolific, they're everywhere, they're in the ground, uh, you're probably carrying around a few billion yourself right now. But this is what's coming in, in 100 mil, basically a shot glass, a shot glass. We've got, uh, let's see, that's 10 million to 100 million organisms in that one little. By those probiotic pills, you ever seen those? It's like 10 billion in one of those capsules. Yeah, we try to keep conditions aerobic as much as possible. Aerobic bacteria use free molecular oxygen. They do a very good job of that. Anaerobic bacteria, when all oxygen is gone, they're going to turn on that, and that's when things get kind of nasty. Facultative uh, organisms can go back and forth, and that's what the majority of talked about our, our pathogens. There's no way to tell who's who. So we just assume they're all bad and deal with them as such. So how do we do this? Well, we do it through wastewater treatment plants. Here's the term POTW, publicly owned treatment plants. This is a nice little small one. I couldn't tell you where the heck it is, but it's a nice little plant. Pretty compact, probably doing a million, million and a half a day, something about that size. Uh, this is Manchester, New Hampshire. It's a 32 million gallon plant right up there along the Merrimack River. If you uh, ever flew out of Manchester Airport, you went right by this. And then there's Deer Island with 350,000 uh, gallons a day, 350 million gallons a day. Huge, huge complex out there in Boston Harbor. You can take tours of this place. It takes quite a while to walk around it. The unfortunate thing about it is you really don't see much of the water. Most of the water you see is Boston Harbor. It's all largely closed system until the very end, right before it uh, discharges out to the bay. So really, all we're doing with this process is what nature would normally do. We're just a little smarter, a little faster. We don't have uh, time and patience uh, that nature does. And we've got some physical, some chemical, but largely a biological process. And plants are designed to treat the wastewater so our effluent does not harm the intended use of the water body to which it discharges. So what you see here is uh, pretty much a basic flow diagram of everything that would happen in a treatment plant if you did everything. Everybody follows the water line, which is the arrows that run across the top of the page. Everybody's going to do that in one device or another, and there's a lot of different ways that this can be done. Uh, this bottom portion varies considerably from plant to plant. Uh, dealing with the solids that we take out of this wastewater uh, is quite a bit of work. Uh, largely a physical operation with some chemistry uh, thrown in to facilitate it. Uh, but it takes a lot of equipment, and small plants don't necessarily want to invest that much money in equipment that they don't run continuously. Larger plants will do that. So uh, Everybody's got to go through a point where they're going to thicken up their material, and then they may send it to a large plant to have them finish it off. I've never seen that before. All right. So we'll break down and get a little more detail on it. Our collection systems, again, network of pipes, tunnels, and conduits designed to take the wastewater from the source to the treatment plant. Sanitary sewers, residential, commercial, institutional, industrial, and whatever squeaks in where it's not supposed to go. Storm sewers are just storm runoff. Ideally, that should be separated and go straight to the river. And you'll, you'll find a lot of them have been labeled, don't dump this, that, or the other thing down there because it's going straight to the sewer. But again, we still have a lot of combined sewers out there. Again, there's various types of piping going on out there. There's concrete, there's steel, there's plastic. I worked on uh, You'll drive around, you'll notice little units like this from time to time. And they're just little pump stations. What this is, is you've got a sewer system in some part of town, but then you've got to get over the hill to get to the treatment plant, so you're going to have pumps in there. 
So this is uh, showing you some of the aspects of a collection system. Uh, by and large, engineers will do their best to have this water flow by gravity. Let gravity do its job, let it run downhill. And that's what we call a gravity main. It's got a manhole and the piping between this manhole and the pump station or what have you just runs at a certain slope so that we maintain uh, flow by gravity. Once we get into that pump station, we have to go over that high point. Now we've got a pump. This system is under pressure. We call that a force main. And there's, there's parameters for these things, and we design these collection systems to operate, whether it's a force main or a gravity main, at a certain velocity. That velocity is average of two feet per second. We want that velocity because anything that gets into that system, we want to make it to the treatment plant. So solids are in there, and if our velocity is too slow, they settle out in the pipes, they clog things up, it's not good. So we want at least two feet per second to get that stuff going. And again, uh, CMOM in Massachusetts now has uh, updated all of their regulations such that uh, they have CMOM wording in there. The CMOM regulations were started being developed back in the 1990s, but never got approved by Congress. So they just kind of hung out there, and they were kind of a, a gray area for a long time. Now EPA and the states have started to put it into actual NIPTES permits requiring plants to do it. If you read the uh, mass regulations, there's about two and a half pages in there just dealing with the CMOM issue on mapping out your system, how often you're going to TV it, how often you clean it, jetting, and all that sort of stuff to deal with situations like this, roots, and stuff like that. Infiltration. Uh, I just saw one recently. Oh, you just heard about Detroit and that whole neighborhood that was thinking in. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that is infiltration. You think of it, I've got a bad or a broken pipe. Every time it rains, water flows into that pipe, but every time the water flows into that pipe, it takes some of that soil with it, too. At some point, there's no soil left to support anything that comes down the street, and, you know, a Honda Civic drops through the street and goes away. It actually happened up in Nashville a couple of years ago. Uh, fortunately, it was early in the morning, so there wasn't much traffic. Going down the street, street opened up, boom. Now I just dropped into it. If you went by on Sunday afternoon, you never knew anything happened. They just filled it back in and paved over it. Never fixed the pipe. What do you think happened two weeks later? It opened up again, lost another car. They said, hey, we got a broken pipe. We've got to fix that thing. Fat soils and grease, <laughs> big issue. <laughs> uh, again, it rides on the surface of water. Every time it, water rises up and hits the cold pipe, it just sticks and slowly chokes up that pipe and we end up with this situation. Uh, this also uh, not ends up in the street, but also may end up in people's basements and all that stuff. Very expensive fix for it. And we talked about the whole uh, combined sewer overflow operation. And, uh, this is showing you one that's set up with a cyclone system so that it takes out the grit. It may also get disinfected before it actually discharges out into the system. So we Use the term pretreatment. Pretreatment is any treatment that's done to wastewater outside the confines of the POTW. If the, uh, the city is dosing lift stations with sodium hypochlorite or potassium permanganate to keep odors down, that's technically pretreatment. And they do that because uh, you go into, a, you know, as towns expand, they put in 150 houses, and there's a pump station, everybody goes to work, and that stuff just sits there all day. And the thing of it is, from the moment you flush, the bugs are at work. They've got food, they've got the bugs, you help put them there. And they do their thing. So the oxygen in the system slowly depletes, and you start to go anaerobic, and those lift stations just sit there all day because nobody around flushing anymore. They get kind of smelly, so they got to dose for that. That technically, at least in Massachusetts, should be done by a certified operator. Industry has to pre-treat. Talked about uh, inorganics that may come into the system. And Massachusetts has industrial certification to help control these things. There are chemicals, there are metals that are not beneficial to the operation of bacterial treatment. And those have to be kept out of the system. So that comes under the category of pre-treatment. 
towns, and we'll talk about the whole system. A municipality has a pre-treatment program where they actually oversee industries, write them permits, and monitor them to make sure that they're not sending stuff to the plant that will be detrimental to their operation. That's pre-treatment. Any facility, this is part of the NIFTIS permit, any POTW with a design flow of 5 billion gallons a day or better has to have a pre-treatment program in in progress. They have to have one. If you're less than five, they may make you have one if you have a significant industrial user in town that could really blow out your plant. I've got a two million gallon plant, but I'm getting 150,000 gallons a day from XYZ chemical company. I have to make sure that I'm watching them on a regular basis to make sure they don't do something. <coughs> and Again, Clean Water Act in 72 initially targeted municipal operations. Uh, amendments to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act in 1977 started addressing industries. So we spent a lot of money making these plants nice, make them operate well. Industry is still messing things up, so we've got to take care of that. So they started addressing them in 77 and, and again uh, in the 80s. They came up with what they called general prohibitions. These are things that industry cannot send to a POTW. But again, it's a general prohibition. The introduction of pollutants to a treatment plant that will interfere with the operation of the treatment plant, including interference with its use or the disposal of municipal sludge. They can't send anything in there that will be bad for the organisms, mess up the way they work, or mess up the way you get rid of your sludge. Again, uh, when you boil it all down, what happens in these plants is we're taking organic matter that we refer to as BOD, and we're going to turn it into bugs. That's all that. Then we have to get rid of all those bugs. So we have to get rid of these things somehow. Uh, I'll give you a situation that uh, happened up in Plymouth, New Hampshire in 2003. A uh, dry cleaning operation lost some of his dry cleaning fluid to the sewer. It blew out his plant, killed the bugs. He had no treatment plant. So right there, he's in trouble. Because if you cause the treatment plant to go in violation, you're responsible for it from an industrial standpoint. Uh, the other problem was, uh, by New Hampshire's hazardous waste mixture rule, all of the sludge that was in their system at the time, whatever thousands of pounds that may be, was now hazardous waste because it had that dry cleaning fluid. It's been an expensive problem at that point. You can't do that. Uh, introduction of pollutants that will pass through. Basically, big, long-chain organic molecules. We've got 8 to 12 hours in a treatment plant. It's like you sitting down with a three-foot subway. You're not going to get that done at lunchtime. What are you going to do with it? Well, they can't treat it all in 8 to 12 hours, so it just passes through untreated, ends up in the river. That's a no-no as far as uh, industry supposed. And this one basically rehashes the first one. Anything that keeps you from recycling the water or the sludge. Well, general prohibitions, any lawyer could dance around a general prohibition. I could probably do it if I wanted to. So they said, okay, we'll be more specific. These are things that cannot go to a treatment plant. Pollutants that create a fire or explosion hazard, anything with an open cup flash point less than 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Solvents, fuels, that sort of stuff, stuff that go boom. Anything that's corrosive, including a discharge with a pH less than 5.0. That's EPA rules. Massachusetts set the limit at 5.5 and no upper limit. Uh, this is Louisville, Kentucky. I left Kentucky in the August of 80, so I just missed it. Uh, you can see some holes in the street. Uh, there's a uh, Ralston Purina has a plant in Louisville, Kentucky making some sort of chow, horse chow, dog chow, cow chow, I don't know. And uh, as part of the process, they have they extract oil without a soybean. And to extract the oil out of soybeans, they use hexane, which is an extremely volatile solvent. Well, they lost a fair amount of hexane to the sewer. Being the lighter than water, it floats on the surface. There was enough oxygen around, and it's a true story. Two ladies on their way to breakfast that morning drove over a manhole. Something on their car provided the ignition source. And manholes for two miles went boom, 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 boom. Thank God. It was called a traffic helicopter in the sky at the time watching the street floor water. Huh. Can't do that. It's not a good thing. 
low pH, largely to protect the collection system, in addition to protecting the organisms. Low pH is the pipes rot out. Boom, next thing you know, it's another truck falling through the street. Solids or viscous pollutants, the amount that obstructs flow in the collection system of the treatment plant. Nothing that can plug up the piping. I go to the extreme, say, and uh, take our friends out in uh, Deerfield at the uh, Yankee Candle. They got a batch of candle wax they don't like, they can't just send that to the store. Well, other things up. Any pollutant discharge in quantities, concentrations that will interfere. Again, metals, certain organics. Can't be discharged in that down there. It interferes with the process. Uh, metals primarily are the biggest problems. Uh, cadmium. You, know, you start to inhibit the process of one pot per million. You're into a total upset of 50. Uh, nickel. Nickel's pretty low, too. Zinc, half a pot per million. Doesn't take a lot to really mess up the bugs. They don't like that stuff. So that is prohibited. Discharges uh, with temperatures above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. 40 degrees Celsius, when it reaches the treatment plant. That's pretty much the drop dead temperature for the organisms. That's why that's there. And the ones that'll just pass through cause the difference. Petroleum oil, non biodegradable kind of oil, big organic molecules just pass on through. Anything that causes a safety issue for the operators of the collection system. And this one's for the midnight hauler. Truck to haul pollutants except at discharge points designated by the POTW. That's not designated by the POTW, unless you're in Jersey. That's all. Good time for us. How are we doing? Any questions there? Yeah, so uh, just a friendly reminder, folks, you can use the chat function on the sidebar. Um, I don't have any questions yet, uh, but feel free at any time to shoot me a question and him to break like he is now. Uh, we can fill those questions. So again, you just want to hover your mouse to the top, get like a green bar. Click exit full screen, and then you can use that chat function to ask questions. So, I don't know if you want to take a quick break now or keep going. Uh, yeah, I think this is a good take. Take seven uh, minutes. Let's take a seven-minute break, and we'll get started at around 10. Next. I'll play it solitaire. Thanks. Okay.
Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to start up again. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, talk about uh, retreatment. That's outside the uh, POTW. Now we're inside the plan. The first step that we have is what we call preliminary treatment. Yeah, that's where we are on our flow chart. Right by. This is the section of the plan we refer to as the headworks. Again, if you think about it, uh, this wastewater has traveled some distance, depending on the size of your town. Again, Deer Island's traveled 35 miles from uh, Framingham just to get to Boston. Uh, other ones are smaller, but depending on pipe leak cycles and stuff, this is the first time this water sees the light of day. It's been confined to the collection system all this time. The bugs have been doing their thing. The oxygen levels are at varying degrees uh, of uh, functionality. Uh, you may have none, at which point the stuff that comes into the plant will smell pretty badly, tend to be pretty dark in color because it's gone septic. Uh, other stuff should be especially gray to light brown and shouldn't be all that obnoxious. Uh, first time it comes up today. So, uh, this picture is showing you uh, Edwards building uh, off of there in the right at Upper Blackstone Water Pollution Abatement District. This is a regional facility here in Massachusetts just outside of Worcester. Uh, it's a 100 million gallon plant. Uh, it actually has two headworks buildings. The one you see on the right is the one that operates all the time. Then the older one that's barely visible on the left uh, is there for high flow conditions. So preliminary treatment is there to remove untreatable solids. We're essentially running a biological process to take in out things bugs can't eat. Again, when I'm talking about bugs, I'm talking about single cell bacteria. They can't eat golf balls, they can't eat two by fours, tin cans, up caps, whatever. And if you talk to anybody who works in the collection system, if it'll fit through a manhole, it'll show up someday. Wagons, <laughs> washing machine tubs, it's crazy. Uh, we also want to protect equipment. This stuff goes in, it can ruin pumps, plug up piping. We don't want that to occur. And as a result, it improves the operation down the street by taking this stuff out. Various methods that uh, we deal with, uh, screening or grinding. We have brick removal, a separate item altogether. It's also, again, because this is the first time this stuff comes to the light of day, uh, we're going to have some odor control because it can be quite nasty. And we're also getting to our flow measurement. We need to know what's going on. So again, ideally, things are going to flow by gravity, but Depending on the geography of your location, that may not always be uh, possible. Uh, this is uh, the influent line to Upper Blackstone, 72 inch line coming in. Uh, they're very fortunate, all their water just flows by gravity. It doesn't have to be pumped, just let it keep on running downhill. This is the uh, vault once it was all closed up. We have a vault here that allows it to go to either of the two headworks buildings, depending on flow rate. And it's enclosed for odor control. Bowl, on the other hand, their wastewater comes in about 30 feet below grade. This needs to be brought up to ground level in order to start working with it. It's totally open, and if you drive by there on the right day, you're going to get uh, quite a smooth flow. Um, so these are just set up that way. And this is the typical method of raising that incoming wastewater in a facility such as that, is with this screw pump. Screw pump can deal with anything that comes in with the influent. It'll just drag it right on up the hill because it's just a powerful machine. It doesn't clog. And it'll actually chew up some of the stuff as it goes. Uh, these situations, they are generally closed for both safety and odor control. Uh, this one is open for some other reason. <clears throat> so we talked about uh, velocities through a collection system. Uh, being generally at two feet per second. We're still at that level as we come into the plant. Now, the plant will have multiple units for treating. And the reason for multiple units is uh, you want everything to run within certain parameters. So I may need a lot of units online during a high rain event, and I may need very few during August when I haven't seen rain in six weeks. So we have to have some method of controlling our flow distribution through the plant. So we run in those ideal ranges all the time. Uh, this particular one's just using slide gates to allow water to go to any number of channels. Uh, this is in Bill Ricca. 
Their incoming flow comes in through this, uh, they call it a blossom, flows up from this pipe, and then they've got three different valves depending on how many clarifiers they're going to operate. So again, this is just to keep things within our prescribed uh, operating ranges. So, we talk about screening. Screening is the most common method of dealing with uh, incoming material. And we're going to remove inorganics and large stuff that will <coughs> jam up pumps and stuff. We don't want things <coughs> that are going to settle out in our uh, treatment plant uh, tanks and such. So we have trash racks, we have bar screens, <coughs> we have grinders also. We'll talk about those. Again, we're still running at essentially that same velocity. We still don't want anything settling out. This is a trash rack. Uh, these are so common. These uh, you may find in lagoon systems or uh, very small operations. But the principle is kind of the same. We've got a series of bars that set at an angle to the wastewater coming in. And they're spaced. The trash rack is very crude, two to six inches. So some big stuff will still flow through here. But anything that doesn't fit between those bars gets caught on the bars. And with the trash racks, the manual operation, somebody has to go out and actually remove that stuff physically with a rake or some mechanism. The unfortunate thing is these things tend to be uh, outside quite often, and they're going to plug usually during the rain event. When we flush everything out of the sewer, and that's not a great place to be during a rain event. Okay. Don't mind me. You want a true thing? <laughs> uh, so there's a picture of a trash rack, very crude screening operation. There we go. Now, a bar screen, which is a little more common in most plants, is much finer. Uh, quarter inch to about three quarters of an inch, so it's fairly tight. Uh, these are pretty hefty steel bars. They have to take the resistance of flow uh, that comes through the plant. Instead of being uh, manually cleaned by some poor guy going out there with a rake, and again, these channels can be about 15 feet deep, they're automatically cleaned. It's got a cleaning mechanism, it's got a rake that'll just drag this material off and clean it up. You can see one of the rakes there. There are different types. Up there. As it drags the material off the bars, you're going to have a big flat plate. We want the water to come off these things and drain back down into the channel. We've got a couple of reasons for that. Okay, you can see the back end of the discharge here. Uh, the material that comes off these is ultimately going to go to a landfill. Easy to dispose of. But landfills are getting very particular in a lot of ways. Uh, they don't want excess moisture. So that's what we, do. we have the drain plate to help keep the stuff in the system. Uh, they're concerned about uh, what we call vector attraction. Vectors are a nice new word for pests, rats and flies and seagulls and that stuff. So we have vectors. They don't want us to have that stuff because if we just send this stuff off loaded with organic waste, that's going to be a problem. Now, as far as cleaning these things on the automatic systems, they generally work off uh, what we call head loss. Head loss is the difference in water elevation upstream and downstream of the screen. As that stream clogs, water backs up upstream. It has to be able to get around the stuff that's clogging. We want to keep that at a minimum. This is the control panel for Nashua. Uh, they have uh, this blue device here on the, uh, the left part of the panel is a level device, ultrasonic level device that measures the height of the water upstream of the screen. Uh, we've got a little PLC in here uh, that's going to control the operation of the cleaning mechanism. So it's set up generally as a time-based thing. It's going to run 15 minutes out of every hour. So the PLC will control that. It's 10 o'clock, it'll run the cleaning device for 15 minutes, then shuts down until 11. And that's all well and good. But now we get a rain event comes in and we're starting to flush stuff out of the collection system. So the screen clogs up faster than it would normally do that. So that's where the ultrasonic level device comes in. It's set at a certain level. It says if it hits this, we don't care about the time anymore. It's time to clean the screen. So that works as a backup so that we don't plug the whole thing up and have the water open the floor. So that's typically the way these things are set up. Again, that's that head loss that we look at. We don't want it to be too big. Because, again, we want our velocity through the system to be fairly consistent. So if I wait and let it build up, build up, build up, and then I clean it, I'm going to get this big flush of water running through there. And that's not what we want. 
There are some that are quite classified as fine screens, a very, very tight spacing. Uh, these can actually replace uh, the subsequent process of primary treatment. Uh, need a good, strong backwash to keep them clean, but it's starting to be more and more prevalent. Uh, here's another method that can be run. This is a tangential screen or an arc screen. The water just comes up and flows over this, and what we have here is this isn't really a screen, but a series of triangular-shaped wedge wires, very closely spaced. As the water flows over it, those wires act like a, a blade and just shave off a little bit of water. The water passes through, the solids stay on top of this, and eventually just discharge off the end here. Again, very tight screening. Something that's been relatively new the past 10 years or so, we're starting to see an increase of these, a rotary screen. Your flow comes in, there's a manifold inside this screen. We've got a big rotating drum uh, with a mesh screen on there. And as the water overflows, the water will pass through the screen, come out uh, nice and clean, and the solids stay inside and eventually get discharged off the end. And our screenings varies considerably depending on what's going on. It's changed a lot. This is a picture from about 10 years ago out in Bill Ricca. Uh, it's got a lot of stringy, weird stuff that shows up. But today, this is what we're dealing with. Oh, God. It's, uh, again, I, I've been watching this over the past 12 years, and it's amazing how it's changed. And this is just, we have these monster blobs in the collection system now from all these wipes. Mm -hmm. It's just huge, absolutely huge. This stuff comes off by tons. You're supposed to have a little diaper pail in your bathroom for those things. You're using that stuff. Yeah. Are those the ones that are supposedly flushable? Yeah. yeah. They're flushable. They can be <laughs> yeah. Yeah, golf balls are flushable if you've got the right toilet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, flushable really doesn't mean a whole lot. But yeah, those yeah. Uh, really should not be in the system. They just thought they plug really pumps. To to and, and this is what? Operators are spending hours a day cleaning this stuff out of pumps Ooh. and pipes. And it's nasty. They know. They know not to. Yeah, it does. Increasingly, as plants go through upgrades, uh, we're starting to see this type of a setup where we're actually washing our screenings before they go to the landfill. Uh, at Upper Blackstone, the material comes off the screens, hits a belt conveyor, and gets deposited into this unit here. Uh, this is what's uh, called a muffin monster. It's a big grinder. Uh, this hopper has a little tubing around the top, sprays water to help wash off any organics from these screenings. Uh, this thing grinds everything up, and then this is a, a pump that will uh, squeeze this material and push it out uh, to go into a roll-off bin, squeezes all the water out. The water goes back into the system and stays there, carrying the organics over the limit. Uh, this will grind up pretty much anything. Perfect. You throw a hunk of asphalt in there, it'll get chewed up. <laughs> you got somebody you're not fond of? This will take care of it. <laughs> and this is what comes out at the far end. It's dewatered considerably because it's really... Squeeze, squeeze the water right out of it, goes off to the roll up, and uh, not a big deal. What do they do with that? Do they burn that? What's that? Do they burn that? No, it goes to the landfill. It's sure. buried. And there's a nice covered roll off. Even that's part of the odor control. Now, grinders, grinders are basically the same thing that you might have in your sink. You've got a, an incinerator or disposal unit in there, it's the same stuff. Same kind of a principle. The water's going to flow through here. There's a series of bars with certain spacing. Anything that passes through the bars is fine, but if it doesn't, it's going to get chewed up by the grinder. This thing just keeps going and chews it up until it passes on through. Common uh, news, in other words. Yeah, it's just like that other unit we saw. You can throw pretty much anything in there and grind it up. So the difference between this and screening is screening actually removes this material and you can send it out to a landfill. This doesn't remove anything. It just chews it up and you have to deal with it later on. So, now grit, sand, uh, coffee grounds, cinders, whatever type of material, density and organic type of material will pass through all of these screens and grinders, but we need to remove it because again, the bugs can't eat this stuff. So it's the next step in our preliminary treatment. All of this material needs to come out non putrescible material. So again, this stuff is particularly nasty because it tends to be very abrasive. It'll eat up pump impellers and pipe elbows and valves and all that stuff. 
uh, clogs pipes that will settle out in tanks and take up space that we don't want. So we want this out of there. So now, again, we're in control. So we're actually going to slow the velocity of this water down from our one and a half to two feet per second we had through screening down to about three quarters to one foot per second. We're going to slow it down just enough so that the dense material can settle, but any organic material, which is still lighter, can stay in suspension. We don't want that settling out. That has to go to the bus. Down to about three quarters to a foot per second. Cut that to one half. We do that just by <laughs> expanding the area of flow. The one thing about this business is you cannot stop it. No matter what's going on in your plant, this water keeps on coming. You can't close the valve and say, well, I'll fix this. Slow it down, I don't have time. Uh, it keeps on coming. And again, it's very dense material, about 100 pounds per cubic foot, so it settles quite readily. Uh, this is a non aerated grid chamber. Again, we've just expanded the area of flow, slowed things down so that grit can settle out in this chamber and it's going to settle down into this area. And on a timer, this rate mechanism is slowly going to plow it down into that little sump you see up in the uh, upper right corner there. And then they've got a screw conveyor to drag that material out of there. Uh, thing about it is, and this uh, this could be Amherst Mass. They've got a system like this. Uh, the material comes in, goes through their flow meters, goes directly into this. Again, it's old wastewater, so it can be rather odorous. So one way that we try to do no matter what our system is, we want to get some oxygen back in this water to shut down any kind of anaerobic operation or even some of the facultative. The ones that are non-aerated grid chambers tend to have a drop afterwards. It's going to flow over a dam, drop a couple of feet. That's just enough to aerate that very well, get it back up and shut down any anaerobic activity. Now, this picture is depicting an aerated grid chamber. This is where we're actually going to pump air in. It has two purposes. We're going to freshen the wastewater and also facilitates the settling of the grid. Uh, and you see the pipe over here on the right hand side is going to inject air and it causes kind of a swirling action inside the chamber itself as it moves through. Changes the apparent density of the water so the material settles more readily and freshens it up at the same time. Uh, down on the bottom of this portion here, you're going to have some sort of a removal system, a chain and bucket or chain and flight system take it away, you know, drag this stuff up. Uh, so this is Upper Blackstone when they were going through their renovations. You see the aeration pipe here on the side. And then uh, down at the bottom is the chain and bucket system. It's going to drag the grit out of this unit. Brings it inside. We've got a bucket elevator. It's just a continuous belt with these buckets in there, scoops up material, and then flings it out at the top for wherever it needs to go. Some facilities, instead of doing this method, <coughs> pump their grit out of the chamber and run it through a cyclone. Cyclones are very good for concentrating solids. The material comes in to this cone-type device, comes in tangentially, the material spins around, the solids go to the wall and get pushed down towards the bottom apex, clear water comes towards the center and comes out through that center pipe. And this, much like the screenings, Increasingly, it's being washed before we send it off. We want to make sure there's no organic matter resting on it before we do. We send it to a tank like that. The water washes off the organics, and then this screw conveyor will remove the grit. It dewaters very well. The grit classifier. Uh, this is down in Wallingford, Connecticut. There's their cyclones right there, and here's the grit washer. There's Chuck Conway's head back there. <laughs> and that's grit. Just what it sounds like. It's grit. Dewaters very well. You don't have to worry about moisture content with these generally. Off to a landfill. It's gone. So again, things that we're concerned with, uh, certainly odors. Uh, this, Ted, there's two smelly parts of a plant. It's going to be your headworks building. It's going to be your solids handling. Again, headworks because of the nature of the old material coming in. Need some air. But we have to have odor control for that particular area in its operations. The health issues, this is raw wastewater. Good, bad, otherwise, we don't know. We assume that it's just nasty stuff with bad bugs in it. Uh, we have to deal with the vector attraction thing. Again, 
wash the organics off our stuff before we get rid of it so it can go to the landfill and they can't get after us. And the moisture content. Go to a landfill, you typically have to have greater than 20% solids of whatever it is you're sending. We have to try to make sure that it's dry enough to be able to go without any problem. Again, odor control, these buildings tend to fall under an odor control situation as time goes on. Uh, a lot of different ways of dealing with the air. There's carbon absorption, there's biofilters, you can use chemical scrubbers with various uh, chemicals in there. Uh, worst comes to worst, use a masking agent. It's just like spraying cheap perfume all around the building and it smells as bad as the building it did before. So. This is Upper Blackstone's new uh, aerated grid chambers, totally enclosed. All of this white piping is all fiberglass piping that goes off to a biofilter. They do a very, very good job. It's a biofilter here. So all of the uh, air from this building, from both buildings, from their aerated grid chambers, all come through this piping and pass through this. The biofilter is really just uh, the big tanks filled with a media. Could be wood chips. Uh, they actually have a, a foundation of a lava rocks. Remember back in the 80s, you get a grill, you had those funky little lava rocks. It's loaded with that and then a bunch of wood chips. And organisms actually live on that media and will consume the odorants as it goes through. So you walk at the end of this where it discharges, you don't smell a thing. That's a very, very good job. Uh, some facilities will do chemical scrubbing. They'll run the air through a scrubber to knock it down. Uh, sodium hydroxide, sodium hypochlorite, very common methods of scrubbing. A lot more complicated. But, uh, so what you see here is a septage receiving station, a very nice septage receiving station. Not everybody lives on a collection system and goes to a treatment plant. There's a whole lot of houses out there that have septic systems. Uh, there's other systems out there. And all of that sludge from those things need to go someplace on a regular basis. You can't be like my father and run your septic system until it finally pops up in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's a good revenue source for a facility, uh, but it has to be managed properly. Uh, swallow plants in particular. This is concentrated wastewater. Uh, this to raw wastewater is like espresso to a latte. Oh. Yeah, this, this is crack cocaine for bugs, so you've got to be careful with how you manage this stuff. And also, you never know for sure what's going to be in those tanks, much as they swear it's good stuff. Uh, it's a screening device that acts as a screening unit, takes out the, all the Legos and the kids' toys that went down the toilet. They'll do pH uh, readings on those to make sure that they're within ranges and stuff. Uh, so, again, uh, it's a good way to deal with things. But if you look at it, if you remember, our solids coming in on raw wastewater is about 200. This is what you're getting out of a septic. BOD, 7,000, that's a set of 300. Uh, it's rough stuff, you got to deal with it and get the whole ammonia phosphorus thing to deal with. So, yeah, it's not one of the nicest places in the plant, and you've got the whole thing of. Drowning? This water. What's that? <laughs> that's why I thought drowning. That's good enough. What is that? What? Drowning. You fall in. No, that's horrific. That's the kind of rule. You do it. Don't fall in. Whatever happens, don't fall in. <laughs> All sorts of, you know, uh, degrading uh, wastewater can generate methane, can generate hydrogen sulfide, other nasty gases. Uh, so explosive toxic gases, when this stuff finally comes to light, uh, possible. You've got rotating equipment, those screens. As sharp as all can be, uh, by the nature of the things going on, the floor is always wet in there. You never know what's going to come off. Uh, you get hypodermics and what have you all out there. You don't have to be careful. Uh, certainly, we still deal with pathogenic bacteria. Uh, it's not a great place to be. I've, I've, I've worked in a lot of different uh, companies, so a lot of, dealt with a lot of nasty chemicals, and wastewater treatment can give you just as much danger as any of those places I've ever been. Interesting. So we've taken out the, the stuff the bugs can eat. We've taken out the two by fours and the pots and pans. We've taken out the grit. Uh, 
So the water is relatively clean looking, uh, but we need to now measure our flow. It's generally at this point that we measure the flow. I say Amherst uh, Mass is kind of an outlier. They measure before they hit all of that stuff. Most people will wait until that's done. We need to know it because we have to report that on our EMRs every month. Uh, we need to know it because we want to run our plant. We need it for process control. What's our flow? What's coming in? What's going on? Uh, probably the most common method of measuring flow is a partial flume. Uh, partial flume is an open channel flow device. It has three sections, a converging section, a throat, and then a diverging section. A particular contour to the floor also. It's set to give a certain velocity through, uh, through the flume. And we're going to measure the height of the water one-third the distance into that converging section. So this is a uh, this is the little devil in Bill Ricca. It's only a three million gallon plant, so it's kind of small. Uh, so you can see the converging section, there's that throat, and then there's a the diverging section. We measure this an ultrasonic level device, measures the height of that at this point. As that height, as the area of flow changes, we can calculate what our flow rate is through the plant. This is Upper Blackstone, one of the biggest flumes around, probably the biggest one in the region. It's about 11 feet across its throat. Thank you. Again, this is our ultrasonic level device. There are other methods. This is up in Nashua. Nashua has a magnetic flow meter. You see it's a closed piece of pipe, and what it does is it sends a signal across this flow, and it's, as it's deflected, it can determine the change in the velocity through that pipe. We can make the calculation. So again, at this point, we're going to go into primary treatment. We're probably going to have more than one clarifier for these operations. That's what you see, these three circular tanks behind the, the blossom here. So the class where we're heading next, and depending on our flow rates, we may need all three, we may need one, we may need two. So we have, again, some method of controlling the flow to whatever number of units we need to have. So we're going into primary treatment. It's our next step. Yes, it's a physical operation. We're going to separate readily settleable solids, the stuff we saw on the bottom of that Imhoff cone earlier, and any floatable materials. And it's also where we equalize side streams. Uh, all of the operations that are associated with the solids handling part, again, when it comes to solids handling, we're taking material that probably comes out to less than 1% solids, and we have to get it to better than 20 so we've got to squeeze all that water out, and that water has to come back at some point. This is generally where it starts to come in. So these terms all mean the same thing. Settling, sedimentation, clarification. The settling of discrete particles by graph. So we're going to remove readily settleable solids. We're going to reduce our BOD by some percentage, 30-ish. Uh, we're going to take some of our suspended solids out during this process, too. So that's what's going to happen in this step. We have talked about that settleable solids analysis. This is what's coming into our primary treatment. This is what it should look like afterwards. Nothing floating up here, nothing settling in the bottom of the cone. There to there. That's our whole job. And again, what we're going to do is we're going to slow things down yet again. Now we're going from one foot per second to one foot per minute should look like still water in these tanks. One foot per minute. You go that far in a minute. That's pretty slow. Uh, in primary settling, an hour and a half to two hours is sufficient. Again, that's probably a summertime. This is probably wintertime because water's denser in the colder temperatures. So we have to deal with have our expectations as a result of that. This is a rectangular settler. Yeah, they're big tanks. cross-sectional area. There's our rectangular tank. We've got to come in here at the left. And again, we want these to be as quiet as possible. So we just can't have this flow come charging into a tank. It'll cause that easy problems. So we're going to have a baffle here to help slow that velocity down <coughs> and spread it across the entire face of the tank. Water's going to move at one foot per minute towards the discharge end. As it does, solids will slowly drop down to the floor. Floatables will slowly rise to the surface. Now at the far end, we've got a baffle there so that floatables won't continue and come up with our effluent. We've got a baffle that goes some distance below the surface. 
Uh, our solids were going to drag out to another device, and uh, our settled water then overflows into a, a trough or launder to go away. This is another view of it. It shows the actual uh, sludge scraping device. It pushes solids, uh, floatables in one direction and solids in the other. So our settled water at the end is going to overflow into, going to pass through a weir into a trough that we call a launder. In that term, we're talking about that trough that receives the, the cleaner water. So here's the uh, chain and flight system. We have to have some method to keep the uh, material moving out of the tank. These blades uh, originally were made out of wood, now they're made out of fiberglass. Uh, on the floor, they're pushing solids towards the discharge point. The ones at the surface are pushing the floatable material towards a receiving unit. And what you, you get some little units here. Because this is dragging on the floor, uh, you don't want to wear out this 16-foot hunk of ply, uh, plexiglass or whatever, fiberglass. You've got all of these numbers, you want to replace them. So we have sacrificial pieces of plastic on them called wear shoes. Those will wear out rather than the entire flight. A whole lot cheaper to replace. And they travel very slowly. Very slowly as they move. And we don't want to generate any currents if possible. Uh, this is upper Blackstone. You can see the flights at the surface. They're pushing uh, floatable material. And if you can just make it out right over this pipe, a change in the coloration of the water surface, that's the accumulated floatables right there. This pipe here is what's called a ducking weir. Two purposes. It serves as the baffle. Good sized diameter pipes will go well below the surface. Floatables can't get past it. On a timer, you can see the openings cut into the top of the pipe. That pipe is going to rotate towards the inlet side so it goes just below the water. That floatable material will flow into that pipe and then go away to receive it. We get nice clean water on this side of it. On the floor, a sludge is being pushed back, and that's generally the case. Sludge is generally pushed back towards the influent end of the pipe uh, tank. So push it down here, down into this sump, and then it gets pumped into the solids handling unit. And what you have here is the baffle, the old baffle on these units. Uh, relatively clean looking water. And for many years, this was the treatment for most cities. Primary treatment, they disinfect, boom. They left 30% of the VOD in there. It's that water. Water flows up, flows into this trough, and travels off. <clears throat> can also be done with a circular settler. Uh, rectangulars are much more common on the primary end because economy of construction. You've got common walls, and civil engineers build these places, and that's what they like. I haven't picked out a civil engineer yet, have I? Very clearly clarify, this is in Bill Ricker. Same thing, the water's going to flow into a a well here in the center is going to slowly work its way to an overflow weir on the outer circumference of the tank. So let's go here. Here we go. Oh, oh. Up in through here, we have, what we've got is another baffle. It's a big circular wall. It goes about three feet below the surface. So the water comes in, can't go straight over to the effluent. It has to hit that wall, come down, and slowly work its way up again. One foot per minute. Solids drop to the bottom, floatables go to the surface, hopefully, all is good. Uh, we've got a rake mechanism that's going to plow this into a well, and again, that gets, comes off to be pumped out later. There's an arm there to pick up the floatable material, skims it off into a receiving unit at the surface. You see that baffle here? Big steel wall. And then there's a rake mechanism, there's that sludge well down the bottom. It turns very, very slowly. There's the, uh, <coughs> for any floatable material, this arm's going to pick it up and push it around, and it's going to come up with this wiper here that runs it up this little ramp, and it'll drop down into this opening here to remove the floatables from the water. Sludge goes to the bottom, gets plowed into the sump, gets pumped away. Well, things that we're considering is our flow rate. Again, we want to run within certain ranges, so if we've got a lot of water coming in because of rain or what have you, 
we need more clarifiers. We've got a certain rate at which we want to run these in terms of hydraulic loading. The type of solids that are coming in, old sludge doesn't settle as well, the age of the wastewater. Addition to your clarifier, obviously, temperatures are going to affect it. Things don't work as well this time of year as they will in August. How fast we take it out. Again, another factor is whatever's coming back in. Do we have thickeners, do we have belt presses, do we have incinerator water, all that stuff comes in at various times. It affects things, all of these materials, further down the road. But at the end of the day, if all has gone well, we've re removed 95 to 99% of settleable solids and all of the floatables. Well, we've lost a little bit of total solids, some of our suspended solids. Our BOD has been removed, reduced. I wouldn't go to 50%, but 20 to 30 probably. And we've got a sludge that, depending on how fast we withdraw, it might be 4% or so, which is pretty decent. But it's not the highest volume. We've got to talk about we want to run these things in, in, uh, in certain parameters, and this is what dictates how many units we're going to have at any particular point in time. The three things that we look at, uh, a wear overflow rate, a service loading rate, and on these, uh, solids loading doesn't really matter. A wear overflow rate is gallons per day per foot of wear. And again, you can see 10,000 to 40,000, these things are pretty forgivable. They can take quite a range of flow before they fail. That's, you figure out how many feet of wear you have on your tank, however it's designed, and each foot should see something in that range. So if it's in August, I'm going to be down around here. I may not be able to take some clarifiers off because I'm getting too low. I don't want it to be in there too long. Too long, it'll start to decompose. It'll generate gases. And it's totally disruptive. Surface loading rate is another one. They're basically design factors. They're not anything a typical operator looks at on a daily basis, the design range. So tell you how many clarifiers you're going to have. And it works back into your O&M manual. So when your flow's at this range, you want so many clarifiers. When it comes down here, you'll have fewer or whatever. This is our primary effort. Relatively clean looking water, ready for secondary treatment. Love for Blackstone. This is a, their old secondary treatment system on either side of this channel. It's even their uh, primary effort. And again, this is what we've achieved. We've come in, this amount of settleables, a little bit of floatables, and we've got virtually nothing on either end after our primary treatment. Got anything in the question area? We don't. Uh, online or calling in, I realize they haven't opened it up. I'm either doing too well or they've fallen asleep. I want to pull up the volume. You all have questions. Uh, they're calling in or, or to bashful pass. There's a lot we've covered, so I'm sure you have questions. All right, folks, we're going to be able to finish this recording guide now. Probably. So let me take another short break and then we'll hit the disinfections. And I'm going to jump over the active uh, the biological treatment because that's going to take all of next week to talk about. We'll go over the various aspects of that. It's more detailed. So we'll just jump over that and go into how we finish up the water before we leave. All right, five minute break and we'll go back to disinfection.
Okay, we're back at it. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, we're going to jump over the biological process, which can get uh, very complicated depending on what we're trying to do. Uh, and we just jump right forward to uh, disinfection. Uh, after the biological process, we go through clarification once again. We have to take out all of those bugs that we generated during the process. So ideally, uh, we've got very clean water. We've got suspended solids down in the low single digit numbers. Uh, really, it should look like drinking water for all intents and purposes. You're doing a good job. The one thing that we have not done anything about at this point is the pathogenic bacteria. Uh, to this point, we assume they're all pathogens and we treat them as such. Now we have to do something before we can throw this in the river. So we're going to go through disinfection. Now, quite frequently, after a clarification step, particularly people who are dealing with phosphorus removal, phosphorus removal, particularly if you're using a chemical, which is pretty much what you have to do to get down to the numbers they're looking at, uh, will leave you with a very, very fine flock that doesn't even settle out in our secondary clarifiers. So, Facilities generally are going to go through a filtration step before they discharge in this situation. Uh, what you see in here are sand filters. A very common method is just a gravity filtration uh, through a sand bed. Uh, but at some point, that sand bed needs to be backwashed uh, to remove the material that you're uh, filtering out. And that, again, goes back into the system. So, uh, much like uh, a drinking water plant type of an operation, gravity uh, sand filter. There are a lot of other, I thought I had a picture here, of newer devices that are out there now, cloth filters and that sort of thing. That has become a regular step in uh, phosphorus removal. So we're going through disinfection and we're not sterilizing. We're not killing all of the organisms in the system. We're just going to kill down to a certain point where we're comfortable that uh, water is safe to be dealt with. So. And our limits, uh, we can be looking at various things. We can be looking at, they're going to be coliform bacteria of some sort. It could be fecal coliform, could be total coliform. Uh, look at E. coli. Some states are doing that. Again, we're generally looking at how many colonies we form in a 100 mil sample. Coliforms, again, are just indicator organisms. They're not necessarily pathogenic, uh, but they're very stout. Although if we killed them down to a certain point, then we shouldn't have to worry about anything else. So common methods are chlorination. Chlorine's been a very common method for disinfection for a long time. Uh, we have ultraviolet radiation and ozone, while it's very specialized and difficult, is starting to uh, make some inroads into the process. Early days of disinfection, liquefied chlorine gas was the method to be chosen. Uh, chlorine was readily available. It was very inexpensive, $4.88. You got a rail car. Why not use it? And it kills. It kills very well. It'll kill you if you let it. Uh, yeah, two and a half times heavier than air. Any leaks tend to pool uh, distinctly at flow level. It's highly toxic. Smell it at very low concentrations. Uh, just walk through our laundry area when my wife's doing white shirts. So, uh, quite soluble in water. Uh, the O-Chapelle, permissible exposure limit, is half a part per million in air. Half a part per million. And if you read the regulation, you'll also find out that OSHA states that nobody should be exposed to more than one part per million. There's not a whole lot of buffer there. So you shouldn't be smelling. But this is what happens, take chlorine gas, mix it with water, and you form hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid is the predominant disinfectant. So we want to make sure our pHs are in such that that is the ion that we're going to generate. So 7 to 7.5, the optimum pH. That's where we're going to generate the most hypochlorous acid out of that solution. We can go above that and below that. You tend to make more hypochlorite, which still works, but it's not quite so uh, effective. We can purchase this material in three different containers. Uh, if you've got a very small operation, you might buy it in 150-pound cylinders for 
like your standard gas bottle. Uh, it's used in an upright position. It has a single valve at the top. That valve has a fusible plug in it that will melt at roughly 160 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. The idea being that we don't want this thing to explode. It's in a fire. It'll just release the gas and let the firemen deal with it, I guess. More commonly, they're going to use one-ton cylinders. There are still a number of plants in Massachusetts that are using liquefied chlorine gas, Amherst being one of them, Newburyport, uh, I forget who else, a couple others. One-ton cylinder holds 2,000 pounds of liquid chlorine. It's used in a horizontal position. It has two valves. They sit on cradles to get the weight of the unit and also have rollers so that you can rotate it and you set it up so that the valves are in a perpendicular situation, one over the other. And if you look internally, one of those valves will take liquid, the other will take vapor off the cylinder. If you've got a really big plant, you get one of these, 180,000 pounds. And this is why most plants don't use it anymore. Once you had this brownish green cloud go over the fence line, kill the neighbor's dog, Somebody downtown says, you know, I heard about this hypochlorite stuff we might want to look at. That is a bad day. That is a really bad day. Oh, there are kits for leaking valves. Typically, you're going to have a leak on the valve. Uh, of any of these. Uh, American Chlorine Institute has devised these three kits uh, for the different units. It's a very complex system. Uh, we've got the A kit for the 150 pound, the B kit for the one ton, and the C kit for the rail cars. Hard to remember, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Hampshire Chemical, we had, uh, we'd bring in hydrogen cyanide cars of the exact same design as these rail cars. And we'd have to practice with these C kit units. A lot of fun. Two ways that we can feed. We can have a pressure system, we could have a vacuum system. Preferred method is the vacuum. <coughs> if I have a pressure system and I have a leak, what's happening? But chlorine gas is leaking out, right? It's under pressure. If I have a vacuum leak, what happens? I'm just going to suck into my system. First, I get is a bad uh, bacterial sample at the end of the day. Well, that's safer from that standpoint. But so with one ton cylinders, they're in a cradle, they're on scale so that you can see how much you're using. Uh, you can take liquid. If we're taking liquid, we'll run it through an evaporator. It evaporates quite readily. There's some warm water is all it takes there. Or I can take gas off the top of the cylinder. Uh, should there be a leak on one of these units, you never put water on the leak. You put water on the leak, now you're forming hydrochloric acid, and a small leak is fast becoming a large leak. The reason that they're on rollers is if you have a leak on your liquid valve, you disconnect and you roll it, so that it leaks gas. Any idea why? Just evaporates in the air? Hmm? The liquid will fill the cleanup and the gas just vanishes? That's not it. No? The liquid, when the liquid evaporates, it generates 479 times volume. Whereas the gas comes out, it just is what the gas comes out. You don't want to fill up the room too fast. Gas chlorinators, method of control, and it's basically just a little rotor meter sitting on top of the 150 pounder. The one ton units are much more complicated and stuff. Uh, a chlorine uh, feed room has to be completely isolated from any other employee area. You can't access it from the office, the warehouse, any place else. You come in from outside, you go outside. That's so if there is a leak, it doesn't contaminate other areas. Okay. Uh, it's two and a half times the density of the acre, so it's going to leak on the floor. The ventilation will be at floor level to draw it away. Again, most people have abandoned liquefied chlorine gas in favor of sodium hypochlorite. Sodium hypo is just chlorine bleach five times more concentrated, about 15% chlorine. Again, when you add it to the water, you're going to form that hypochlorous acid, keeping in that same pH range. But you don't have any gas clouds going away. You just 
have tank trucks rolling over in your driveway or something like that. You got a drum of material and a little uh, metering pump, you can go and chlorinate any place you want. Works very well, easy to control. Now there are some systems, uh, very small systems, might be an alternative system or it might be a lagoon system that will use calcium hypochlorite. If you've ever had a pool and use HTH, that's what we're talking about. 70% chlorine in these tablets. Got to be very careful on how you store them. But again, once you add it to uh, the water, hypochlorous acid, same deal. What you've got is these tablets inside of some unit and then you just regulate how fast the water goes through and dissolves the tablets. That's very common with lagoon systems where you don't have somebody hanging around all day long. So, we have what's called a dosage. We're going to dose a certain amount of chlorine. It's based on chlorate generally in pounds. And what we do is we want to make sure we've got enough in there to get the kill that we're looking for. And we also want to have a safety factor that we call a residual. So our dose is our demand, the amount we need to get the kill plus the residual. So if I need four to get the kill that I'm looking for, and I'm going to have a residual of two to my safety factors in case things change as things go on. Uh, and I'll be all like it says, I'm going to dose it six milligrams per liter. Very simple operation, not hard. Here's one thing that may complicate it, though. It's what we call breakpoint chlorination. Uh, when treatment plants uh, dose chlorine, they are generally looking for total chlorine residual. A drinking water plant, in all probability, will go for a free chlorine residual. It's a whole different thing. Uh, because drinking water is generally dealing with pretty clean water, nothing else around. Uh, we've got a lot of other different stuff, such as nitrogen compounds and various other things that react with the, uh, the chlorine. Chlorine is a very strong oxidizer, so if there's something around to react with, it'll do it. And if we have nitrogen compounds in there, they'll form chloramines, which will still do some disinfection. It's just not as effective. It's called combined chlorine. But this breakpoint idea is, uh, takes a little while to kind of finally grasp the whole thing. It took me a couple of years before I fully understood what the heck they were talking about. Okay, if you have free chlorine, that means I'm reading free chlorine. There's a chlorine ion floating around that water. As opposed to combined chlorine, which is a chloramine, ammonia and chlorine combined. Put them together and you've got total chlorine. A break point is when you've reacted every possible thing in there and for every little bit of chlorine you put in, you get that amount of free chlorine in your test. So what's happening through here, okay, do. I'm gonna add chlorine. I've got, still got some bacteria in there. I haven't removed all of my solids. Uh, I've got some other components, maybe a little bit of metal or something like that. I put chlorine in and I see no chlorine at all. It's forming chlorides, it's breaking down other materials. Once those are gone, I'm going to get some combined chlorine. It's going to start ammonia compounds forming chloramines, which would show up under a combined chlorine test, but I wouldn't have any free chlorine. I'm going to keep adding chlorine to the point where I now break down all of those chloramines. Break down them. And I get to a point called the break point where now if I add one milligram per liter of chlorine, I get one milligram per liter of free chlorine in my test. For drinking water, that's not hard. For us out here, this is a huge amount of chlorine to get to a free chlorine. So we don't. We go based on a total chlorine. Combined plus free, and there's generally no free. So as long as we're getting the kill, we're good with that. Contain, control it a little. We control it manually, throw proportion, residual control, ORP, the various ways of controlling our dosages. Typically, it's a flow proportion. Got a flow meter that sends a signal to a controller, says add this much chlorine. As the flow rate goes up, chlorine goes up, as the flow rate goes down, chlorine goes down. Ideally, everything works fine. But again, things could happen. Maybe you get a little upset in your clarifier, something like that. Stuff could go by that you wouldn't have enough there. So we can do a residual chlorine. We're actually going to sample after our treatment with the chlorine, which is a 30 minute delay time. 
and say, okay, I want to have so much of a residual, and that's going to tell us how much chlorine to add to the system. And then we get into more complicated instrumentation systems, compound loops, where I'm going to feed based on a flow meter, plus I've got a residual as a backup to override if I need to. And then this cascade control, where controllers are talking to controllers, gets very complex. And all to make sure you get the test that you're achieving. For chlorine disinfection to work, ideally you've got three minutes detention time in your contact chamber at average flow. You need the time for it to be done. You need good mixing because all the organisms have to be exposed to the chlorine. You need good mixing. And this is the prescribed design, the serpentine type of a tank. <clears throat> You find very few that look this nice. That's Nashua, not so nice. Deep, but not very nice. So, again, chlorine was cheap, so I said, okay, we'll disinfect. They just throw in chlorine like crazy. So they had this huge residual going to the river. And the fish were turning white. So EPA said, oh, back off here. Come on. You're going to have to dechlorine. You can't have that much residual chlorine going into the waters. So now they limit, so we have to dechlorinate. You can have as much residual as you want for your safety factor, but you have to get rid of it before you can discharge. And they get pretty small numbers. I think the upper Blackstone's at 12 parts per billion. <clears throat> so originally, when liquefied chlorine gas was so popular, so was sulfur dioxide. A very nasty liquefied gas, ugly, terrible. Now. I don't know anybody that's still using that. That's gone. Uh, sulfur salts, sodium sulfite, sodium bisulfite, and various solutions that you can buy. SO2, uh, colorless, heavier than air, very corrosive, forms sulfuric acid. Uh, the bisulfites work very well. It's just another tank truck coming in, a storage tank. But it is corrosive and you don't want to bathe in it. Uh, they like this stuff because same vapor density, you can use the same regulator on your uh, cylinders, very detectable. <coughs> it's gone. And it was also basically one pot for one. So if you had a two uh, milligram per liter residual, you put in two milligrams per liter SO2, everybody was happy. The Bill Rick has that little unit. It's an instantaneous reaction. Forms of chloride, it's just a little salt now, and nobody cares. Put it right at the end of your contact chamber. A lot of facilities said we don't want to deal with chemicals. Uh, I don't want employee exposure. I don't want tank trucks. I don't want storage tanks and pumps and leaks and all of that stuff. I'm just going to write a check to National Grid and be done with it. So they've gone with ultraviolet radiation. It's also very popular with small systems. What it is is light bulbs and water. What's the worst that could happen? A lot of light bulbs and water, as you can see. Again, no transport, no storage, no hazardous chemicals, there's no DUV like this D-chlor. There's some savings there. But here's the difference. Nobody dies. Chlorine kills, UV doesn't kill anything. Uh, the physical process that inhibits the uh, organism. Got to have the right amount of energy to do it, and the light has to be absorbed by the organism. That's why you see so many bulbs in that channel. We talk about UV light. The range of ultraviolet light is 40 to 400 nanometers. The light that's effective for disinfection is about 254 nanometers. So the majority of the light emitted by these bulbs is in that range. And it messes up their DNA so that they can't reproduce. They've got a lifespan of minutes, basically. So you throw them in the river, they die with no offspring. Nobody cares. But they don't die. Not from this, anyway. Bulk of where the light comes out, 53.7. And it's various types. This types where all the wiring's above the water level, some go down inside. Uh, there's issues, again, the light has to hit the organism. So if you have turbid wastewater, you've got solids in there, that could be a problem. That's blocking the light. These are, a lot of them have wipes on them, so that if material collects, they, the bulb actually sits in a quartz sleeve for protection. If material can collect on that sleeve, 
and block the light beam so they'd have wipers that would go on it. Had a lot of trouble with the early versions, they were snapping the bulbs, which is not good because they contain mercury. You need a lot of them. So if you have turbidity issues, it could be an issue. Okay. Lots and lots of lights. Uh, these are fairly old units down in Wallingford, Connecticut. Each one of these boxes indicates a set of lamps down inside that channel. Concerned with high suspended solids, got to make sure your bulbs are transmitting properly. Metals can be a problem, hardness, collecting on the, the sleeves and organics. If, uh, do we go to fast food restaurants anymore? Inside? Awesome. Look around, see if you can find a blue light on the wall. I, I get a kick out of this. I've seen it in restaurants, I've, I've actually seen it I've found a Leahy Clinic working there. Light up on the wall, it's an ultraviolet light. Supposedly to disinfect. You know, it's disinfecting about four square feet of wall where it's shining because you can't see it in the rest of the room. They can. Huh. Ozone. Ozone is an extremely strong oxidizing agent. Very strong. It has to be done on site. It's very complex and difficult to deal with. In the case here. Europe does, and they do all sorts of crazy things over there. They, they've been pretty good with it. And I'm starting to see some inroads here in the United States where we use an ozone as a disinfecting agent. But it's not a popular thing. We tried it at Hampshire for a while on a different process, and it's more trouble than it's worth. Ali corrosive reactive. Uh, there's actually, and to talk about chemical pretreatment, uh, there's a t-shirt manufacturer up in Keene, New Hampshire, called Three Dog Moon. I don't know if you ever heard of those guys. And they were giving the Keene treatment plant fits. Because when they did the red and the blue dyes for their shirts, color would travel right through to the plant and drive them nuts. So they actually installed an ozone system to knock that color down. Chlorine wasn't working, so that's to go to ozone. Very expensive system, but it's keeping them out of trouble with the treatment plant. So. so VODs down, suspended solids down, maybe our nutrients are down where they should be. Uh, we've got nice clean water. Uh, we've killed off the pathogens. It leads everybody to a point where we're happy. One final thing to do before we let this go. The last time this water saw any air was back in our biological process. We have to pump a lot of air in there to keep the bugs happy. So it went through a clarifier, which is probably two to three hours. It went through a contact tank, which is a half an hour. So there's still a little bit of food, a little bit of bugs, and no oxygen. So what we have to do is re-aerate. Because now this is going into the stream, and all this is part of is going down to what we refer to as the assimilative capacity of the river. Our water is now going to go into this receiving stream, and we want it to disappear in that stream as quickly as possible. We don't want you to go and sample a mile downstream and say, was down to about three because treatment plants got no oxygen in their water when they throw it in. They want it to go away. So permits invariably will say that you must have a dissolved oxygen content in your effluent of a minimum of six milligrams per liter. We've got to get that in there. And again, it depends on how things go. Uh, this is Wallingford, Connecticut. They actually have to pump air in based on the way their system works. So these aerate it just like we. Uh, would have maybe in our grid chamber. Uh, Bill Ricker, the same deal. That's the way it works. They have to pump air in to get that dissolved oxygen up. Upper Blackstone again, is very fortunate, and their water all flows downhill. When it comes out of their contact chamber, it goes over a weir similar to this, and then drops about eight feet. You've got six in a heartbeat by doing that. Uh, some other places, you go to Brockton, it cascades somewhat similar to this down a series of steps. All that, just that little bit of activity is enough to get that oxygen there for free. So now when it goes in, it doesn't kill off the oxygen in the stream. It just kind of blends right in, and hopefully uh, you never see anything. Uh, this is something that we may see uh, one of these days, as particularly out west, where a lot of uh, this water could be used for irrigation. Say, hey, wait, stop taking the nitrogen and phosphorus out. We'd like that stuff. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Uh, Massey, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Uh, where's my friend? Stephen said, yeah. They test your waters upstream and downstream to see what the effect of your wastewater is on the receiving stream, how fast it blends in. Yes, that assimilative capacity. How fast does your material disappear? Temperature-wise, dissolved oxygen, pH. Uh, our discharge went into the Merrimack River. We had a pipe that extended out to the midpoint of the river. It had 14 nozzles to help blend that stuff out. They call mixing zones. What you got to do to mix that into the river as quickly as possible so that there's no actual detriment to the whole thing. The other thing that occurs, uh, here we go, yeah, the testing for various things, is what they call whole effluent toxicity testing. Are you familiar with hear that? It's a strange thing. Uh, we would do it quarterly, and what we would do is we would take water from upstream from the river, and then we take our water and we'd send it off to a lab. And they would test it. What they do is they keep making increasing concentrations of our wastewater into the river water, and they would test for seriodaphnia, which is a water flea, and uh, fathead minnows. And they could go until our wastewater would kill 50% of them. It's a fun job, huh? Oh my God. I'm counting fathead minnows. <laughs> and, and the question always is, in fact, somebody asked me this uh, in my classes last fall, is what happens when you fail? I have no idea. But the test is so accurate that it could take more than 100%. So, crazy. But that's uh, another thing that they test for. Uh, what is your effect on the river stream? So all of those. And that, I believe, is, must be that. All right. Any uh, questions? I did get a question. Oh! Uh, pretty, excuse me, pretty specific to, uh, do you have any experience, Jim, with parenthetic acid? No, I don't, and I've only recently heard of that. And apparently, there is some work being done in that area, peritonitic acid for disinfection. Uh, but I, I have none myself. Any questions? Pretty new concept. Folks in the room, other folks uh, on the line, feel free to use the chat. Thanks, Dan, for asking uh, my question. Um, I know this is going to vary, the answer to this question is going to vary a lot depending on the plant, but I'm just trying to grasp the concept of how long it takes from water to get from the beginning of the plant to the end. Is it hours, minutes, days? Not minutes. It's 12 hours, generally. Uh, okay. It goes through pretty fast, and the bugs are extremely quick in what they do. Have to. Can't get people to stop flushing at 8 p.m. <laughs> Hold up until tomorrow morning. Yeah, that that that's one of the challenges. Whatever is going badly in your plant, you can't stop the water. You just can't. It's just going to keep on coming, no matter what's going on. The uh, yeah, when you when you look at a treatment plant, there in order to to facilitate that operation, that no matter what happens. All the lights go out every place else. There's going to be generators in two locations at the plant. You're going to have a generator at your headworks building. Because no matter what happens, if you can't keep those screens clean, then it's coming out the doors and windows and running all over the place. And the second one's down at disinfection. No matter what happens to your plant, you're going to disinfect that water before it goes. Because it's going to keep coming. It doesn't matter if the power's out in everybody's house. Because the drinking water plants, in all probability, is still running. I don't mind that so. I got, I got water, if nothing else. So. That water keeps coming. They got to disinfect it even if it goes out. So okay. that's a regulation that's in the books that they have to have there. Other than that, you just run around like crazy trying to straighten it out. So those are the only contingency plans, just in terms of any kind of fail, just basically keeping things running, as opposed to any other kind of alternative system, you know, because you can't shut down. Well, when you say like if things are going badly, yeah. um, there's got to be some measures that you can take while things are going badly. You know, okay, okay. You, you, have, you have multiple units. It's not just one pump running everything. You have other ones you can switch to and mm -hmm. do what you got to do to get by. Uh, again, for the most part, once you're, you bring that water up to ground level, it generally tends to run on gravity, the water side of things. Anyway, it uh, One of the reasons that we need to keep, uh, you know, the I and I down to a minimum, is because again we're, we're talking about big tanks full of bugs that 
if your flow is too high, that goes. And that's one of the things that is a common operation. If you get you know, that three inches of rain in an afternoon type of a deal, it's amazing how that flow changes up when you consider the area that you're covering. Uh, you can just kill your aeration, let your bugs go sit on the floor and let the water just pass on through as long as you're just infecting at the end. You can actually bypass under certain conditions. And bypass is a, is a naughty word in this business, but under certain conditions, you've got to save your plant. Because you know, if all your bugs are on the way to Narragansett Bay, then what are you going to do tomorrow? So, certain things like that. But it, it can be a challenge sometimes. My particular operation was strange in that you know, I didn't have multiple. I had one clarifier. And when that broke down once, we all went into a panic because we didn't know what the heck we were going to do. So it varies from plant to plant. What happens when maybe somebody discharges something that kills all the bugs or something like that? How do they replenish that supply of bacteria? Again, you, like the situation up in Plymouth and, and some other, you have multiple trains. Okay. So depending on uh, how bad it is, maybe you just wiped out one train and you can bring the other one back online. Worst comes to worst, you bring in sludge from somebody down the road and reseed the whole system. It's still, you're going to be in violation probably for a week or so before you get things back to normal. That's all you can do. And that's why you know, it's very critical to have that pre-treatment operation doing what it's doing. And that's the thing. Generally, things don't happen that quick. You know, somebody nukes your plant like that, you know, they just dumped a whole ton of cadmium into you. Nothing you can do. Most things change very slowly. And that's where you know, process monitoring, the process control is really important. Like the microscope exams, I guess we're going to be doing it again for the commission, we'll have little bugs out there. Uh, to me, that's a very critical thing. These systems change very slowly. And again, you're relying on five-day data, like BOD's five days old. So you gotta monitor and see what's going on. It's very crucial. I, I'll be honest, I've not run a municipal plant, but to me it does to seem kind of boring to some degree. Because again, my place was just all over the place because it was an industrial situation for different things. These things are very consistent, what their influence is like. It doesn't change a whole lot you know, unless somebody messes up it wherever. But. Which, you know, 
this is all well and good if you're going to build a new plant, but nobody's building a new plant. How do you do deal with the old plant? You can't just jack the whole thing up 10 feet try to get it across. But there are things that can be done, and that's what we're addressing this spring in our training. We've got uh, three training courses uh, scheduled: one in Portsmouth, if I remember, Portsmouth, New Bedford, and somewhere in Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, I think, to address those issues. Yeah, there's a lot of this big planning and, and how you're going to deal with it. All right. We good? Well, thanks for uh, calling in, folks. Thanks, everyone in the room, for joining. Um, friendly reminder, we have another minute next week. Uh, it'll be Wednesday of next week, same time. Uh, different call-in number. You should have that login information. And then we're going to skip a week. And February 1st will be the third and final unit with its call in and log in as well. Again, everyone have a great day. Thank you.